<laughs> um, thank you so much for being here this afternoon um, for our third church family meeting. Um, as you recall from the first two, hopefully you were able to make it. The first one, we talked uh, mostly about the transition and how things are progressing there, which I, I think are progressing very well. In the second church family meeting, we um, really started uh, talking about the vision that God has laid on the heart of church leadership and had a lot of great questions, a lot of interaction, very much appreciate that. Today, Pastor Brian and Pastor Jeff are going to really dig into that a little bit more um, and give you much more information on that and uh, where we are in that process. Jeff is trying. Hey, <laughs> Jeff. I'll give you a microphone in just a moment. Um, but, uh, so, uh, but one thing I do want to stress is that um, as we get to the end, we want to have, definitely have time for questions, and we want to open up the floor to any questions, whether it's about the transition, whether it's about vision, uh, what's going on in the church, etc. So, so please feel free to ask any question uh, that's on your heart. Um, so let's go ahead and take a moment and ask God to bless our time together. Father, we thank you so much uh, for just the opportunity to serve in this church. You're an amazing God, and, and you've given us such a wonderful church to be a part of. So uh, today, as we hear um, the vision that you've given us, we just ask that you'd give us uh, hearts and minds to hear, uh, that you'd uh, bring the questions to the surface that, that need to be asked so that everyone can uh, really see things in the same way. We ask that you bless um, Brian and Jeff as they bring us... Um, through this time and, and really help uh, people understand uh, the vision again that you've laid on our heart. Uh, we ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. There we go. Um, I would echo what he said about thanking you for being here today. Um, if you've already been in worship and maybe an adult learning community, it's a long day, but these are important things. That's why we want to talk about them. We won't talk a lot today about the uh, transition plan. You will have a chance to ask questions about that if you have them at the end of our, what we talk about. But I would just remind you uh, briefly that <clears throat> that all came about because of me being convinced that um, God was leading me to a new season of ministry. And so the EC eventually affirmed my decision to step out of my current role into a new role which hopefully I'll be in for at least five years full-time, preaching, working in leadership development and organizational development. Jeff, pending vote of the membership in August, will become the senior pastor and leader of our staff. So that's the basics of it. Um, but I wouldn't be going anywhere. I'd be here full-time, just in a different role for a period of time. And we can talk about that later if you have questions about it. What we want to spend our time on today is um, the vision that's developing among our senior leaders and our staff for the future of FBCG. And let me just... Before we talk about that, it's important to remember where we've come from and how we got to where we are now. Because a lot of times the future becomes more clear when we understand the trajectory of where we've been. Uh, we became, and some of you have been around long enough to know this story, but FBCG became two campuses almost by accident uh, in 2004. The growth uh, we experienced in the late 90s when we just had one campus, the East Campus, was dramatic. Uh, we ended up, uh, after lots of study and several years of struggle, uh, finding this property here at Peck and Kesslinger, and we built phase one, what we called phase one at that time, of our new campus in 2004, fully intending to build that out. And the whole plan at that time it was a, about a 200-some thousand square foot facility out here, including a 2,000-seat worship center right out there, right out here. Uh, in the grassy area. Um, and so that's where we were headed, and we continued to have growth. Uh, and then in 2008, a lot of things happened. The economy kind of went south. We saw that happening. We put everything on hold before um, taking on a bunch of debt. And we put everything on hold. And over the next couple of years, as we just held and sat on those plans, uh, we began to realize that maybe God had sort of protected us in a way from taking on a whole bunch of debt at the wrong time. Uh, and uh, we then realized, subsequent to that, that maybe he was calling us to be permanently multi-campus, at least for the foreseeable future. So we settled into developing and learning how to do multi-campuses, multi-service, multi-pastors preaching, and that sort of <coughs> model. And we did it because it was necessity. We had these two campuses. Uh, then, a couple of years ago, we began to review that whole project, 
uh, and we saw we, after more growth, we needed to do something else here at this campus. We called that project Growing to Serve, and that expansion project involved three um, uh, goals. One was to retire the debt that we still had left over uh, three or four years ago. Uh, from the first building of this campus, which we retired. Uh, we renovated the East Campus into a beautiful campus upstairs and downstairs that we have now. Many of you worship there. And we uh, expanded the West Campus going to the north um, in two levels, in space we needed for breakout rooms, children's ministry, special needs ministry, and that sort of thing. And, and that was growing to serve. We did not do the final phase of that project, which we thought would be a, a large lobby to that side of the building and a 300-seat venue out where the lobby is now uh, because we, di we, we didn't raise enough money for that. We were committed to only spending what we raised instead of taking on uh, large debt. Uh, so that's what we did, and that's the building we're in right now. Uh, then last year, uh, roughly, uh, beginning of 2015, we started to get out the plans again uh, to look at finishing off Growing to Serve, the rest of that project, the part we had not finished uh, because we, are, we were online to finish paying off this part by the end of this year, 2016, so we should start looking at that plan. It takes a long time to evaluate these things, and we always get out our plans again to look at them and evaluate them. Is this really what God wants for us? Is this really what we should do? And while we were in the process of looking at that, we were approached by another church in our region about the possibility of what they called a merger. And we talked about that a little bit last time. We did not say the name of the church. We weren't far enough along. Now we'll tell you what that church was. That church is Faith Baptist Church of Mill Creek, which was formerly for over 150 years Faith First Baptist Church in Batavia. So put the picture up there of the, of the, of the street side. That's what Faith Baptist looks like today. It's in, Mill, in the Mill Creek subdivision. It's, it's about four and a half miles from where we are sitting right now. It's... Um, up uh, Main Street in Batavia, going west for a few miles before you get to the Markland uh, um, facility there. And you'll see this building right on the right. Some of you may know that if, about three years ago, uh, Grant Diamond left our staff and became the pastor of Faith Baptist in Mill Creek. And Grant is the one who approached us about a year ago about the possibility of a merger. So, subsequent to him talking to us about that, uh, we, as the senior leadership team, which is Jeff, myself, Doug Kite, and Pastor Bruce McAvoy, all went out to look at that site, to look at the church, to walk around in it, because we really weren't thinking about something like that at that time. We were considering what we were going to do at this campus. And we all, um, we just struggled to see how we could use that facility to impact our ministries here at FBCG. And so we basically, after visiting a couple times, uh, said uh, thanks, but no thanks. But then about a month later, we were on a retreat together, the four of us, and we all sort of admitted to each other, and I can't remember exactly how it happened, but we all sort of admitted to each other we were still thinking about that site, mm -hmm. that we couldn't quite get it off our minds. A couple of us have even woke up in the middle of the night thinking about it. And so we kind of thought that, well, maybe, maybe there's something there that we're supposed to see that we haven't seen yet. Maybe we need help in understanding what we're supposed to see there, because it just felt odd that we were all still thinking about it after we said no. So, we so at that point, we decided we needed help, and at that point, I'll let Jeff take over and tell you that story. Yeah. You've, many of you heard parts of this already, but I think, um, first of all, pr thanks for coming. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. It means a lot, looking out and see all the faces that I know and love and, uh, and, and that you care enough to be here. And if you've heard this before, I think it's good to repeat it, and for those of you that haven't, uh, when we decided to revisit that, we, as Brian said, we thought we needed help. And actually, Grant Diamond had sent to me a, a link. I was thinking about how this actually unfolded a link to a podcast of somebody in the multi-site leadership area. And I didn't really pay attention to that email, but I listened to it one day while driving by a guy named Jim Tomberlin. Some really wise things to say and some good insights on what the trends in the church today and uh, some great things that are happening, some mistakes church churches are making. And I thought, maybe that's the guy to bring in. He actually was on staff with Willow Creek shortly after I left there many years ago and helped Willow go, but not that we're, anyway. So we brought him in. Uh, to observe our services and, our, and meet with our staff and meet with our senior leadership team. And in the course of that, while well, his visit over dinner on, after a service on Saturday night, he used the phrase, see, see initially, one of our reactions was, that's too close. Why wouldn't people just come to the West Campus? Why would we do that? It just seems too close. That was my first reaction. 
And he said, well, maybe you should think of yourself like the new parish model, like a neighborhood church. That, he did, we moved right on with the meal. But that phrase jumped out to me. To this day, it still gets me excited. I, I felt something in my spirit stir. I, talked, I texted Brian on the drive home. I think he felt the same thing. I thought, there's something in that phrase, which I didn't fully comprehend and just coming to now. Neighborhood church, what does that mean? Um, what it's come to mean for me and for us, and if I miss a step here, jump in somebody, is that I began to think about, so, so if you think about, we talk about reach, connect, equip, and serve around here a lot. That's really the how or the strategy, if you will. Our mission, we used to say to honor God by making more disciples. More recently, Brian and I have begun using the phrases to transform lives to impact the world. You've probably heard us say that on a number of occasions. The gospel transformed lives and transformed lives impact the world. That's our mission. That's why we exist to see lives transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ to make an impact in the world, beginning right here and around the world. That's what Serve the World is a part of. That's, why we, that's the reason for our church's existence. Reach, connect, equip, serve is how we do that. Reaching people with the gospel, connecting them in, to God through Christ and to each other in community, equipping them with the word of God and in prayer to unleash them to serve in the world. I know you've heard that many times, but it's good to say. I began to think, we began to think, what is that going to look like down the road? So we, we've, we've talked about mission and, and strategy, but vision is a picture, Brian always says, of the future that produces passion in the present. And I began to ask myself this question, even reading in some books that, on the subject, do we really expect more and more people to drive from farther and farther away to a bigger and bigger box here? Is that the end game? Is that what transformed lives and impacting the world will look like here? A bigger and bigger box here. We know that 80% of our worshiping congregation comes lives within a 15-minute drive of our two campuses. What's it going to look like? And I think the answer to that is no. And I think the answer to that, that God is beginning to crystallize for us, and we're in the very beginning processes of this, is a family of neighborhood churches committed to that mission. A family of neighborhood churches committed to seeing lives transformed and making an impact in the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Family, that's an important word for us. We use that word a lot around here. Families share the same DNA biologically speaking anyway, right? They share the same history. You have stories in your family you tell every time you get together, right? We have families, as, stories as a church family we tell. If you've been around long enough, you know some of those stories. Families share the same leadership. They share the same responsibility. They hopefully, if they're a healthy family, share the same direction and purpose. That's what we mean by a family of neighborhood churches. Not necessarily clones, but I think we have a God-given opportunity and responsibility to reproduce who we are as a church, not just to make it an infinitely large here in this footprint. We are beginning to see the Faith Baptist Mill Creek opportunity as a step in that process. It may not materialize. We'll get to some of those things in a minute here. We are right now in the stage that's called the feasibility stage. If the, there's three phases, if you will, or stages. The first one is, is this even possible? Initially, we said no, right? But Brian told you that. We've come to say, yes, we think this is possible. Um, is, uh, did they get the name wrong? It's possible, yeah. Is it, does it, the next stage, is it, fe is it feasible? Meaning, there's a hundred different things that could derail this. Legal things, financial things. There's a list of 25 issues that we have to answer and their board has to answer. We're in the process of doing all that. We've hired legal counsel. We're looking deeply into the financials and Doug and others can talk to you more about that. But we're in that feasibility stage to determine, is this feasible? Or maybe it's possible, but it's just not a good decision. We're in that phase. Assuming we come out of that with a yes to the feasibility, then it's, is it desirable? And that's going to be up to you, our congregation, to vote on that. So just so you know where we are, we've gone from, I don't see it, to maybe God's doing something here, to now in the feasibility stage of, could this work? And if we come out of this, I think we're going to, you know, we'll move toward the, the desirable stage. Did I get, did I skip a step in there? Okay. So just a little bit about the, maybe the third campus. If some of you are wondering, like, what is this, what would this look like? And again, we, we want to be, um, one of the struggles I think we met as, a, as, as an executive council, I don't know if you alluded to this or not, I was fixing my mic, but we met them, we met together fr most of the day Friday and part of the day uh, yesterday, Saturday, uh, talking about these very things. One of the struggles is how much to say and how soon to say it. We want to be open and fully disclosing and, 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 and I, I have a tendency to say too much sometimes, but we didn't say the name of the church last time we met for that for reasons of confidentiality, because they're right down the street or right in, the, in our region. Um, so I want to be honest, we don't have all this figured out. There's not a secret plan in place with every question answered. We're in the process of figuring these things out. But in my mind, what I think this would look like, and not just mine, our, our shared collective 
We, we share a mind, if you don't know if you knew that. <laughs> it's imagined like this, that a launch team of staff, and say, let's just say for the sake of discussion, a hundred people from our worshiping congregation now who live in or near Mill Creek, who have a deep desire, a growing passion to reach their neighbors for Christ, to love them, to serve them, and to reach them. That's the team that goes there, whatever that is. And then three years from that, from that, from that point, just imagine with me, 200 more people or more, 100 more families that weren't there in the beginning, that have come to Christ and in that church since, dozens of children reached, dozens more families meeting in homes throughout the week, reading the Word of God together, more people knocking on doors in Mill Creek talking about the love of Christ, more people inviting people from all three campuses to some of the exciting things that we do to serve the world around here or for Masterpiece Ministries. I think if we're going to continue to see lives transformed and the and serving the world, it's not just going to be here and these campus a mile apart. Um, and so that, that's, that's what's in our, what gets me up and it gets me excited and what's in our minds. This thing, Will Creek, may not happen. It may be that at some point in the feasibility phase, we come to the place of saying, mm, this, is not, this is unwise. I want you to know, I don't think that changes the vision. Even if this is a no on this one, I think the vision still is to reproduce ourselves in the neighborhood church model. And God will show us when and how to do that. I'm struggling now not to hold too tightly to this one because I get excited about the vision, right? I want to hold an open hand and say, God, you've led us this far. You'll bring us where we need to be. So, um, yeah, I think that's enough. I'm sure there'll be more questions, which we'll get to at the end. Good. And uh, so the question right now is what does this mean for um, next steps uh, for our church and our leadership? Um, And we want you to know we are... As Jeff said, we're working on the one hand on the the feasibility of taking on a third campus in the neighborhood church vision, but at the same time, we're working in another direction. Uh, We're also uh, studying, looking at this campus, our West Campus, to determine what needs to be done here, what yet needs to be done here uh, in terms of developing this campus. Jeff talked about not a bigger and bigger box of people drive from further and further away, but maybe a bit better box, and here's why. There are three things we're considering here at this campus. One is our nursery space is already stretched here uh, beyond its ability to care for our children and families well. Uh, Not particularly on Sunday mornings right now, but in our midweek women's ministries are bringing in so many new people and new children that we're having to use even right now extra space that is not nursery space that ultimately becomes kind of a security risk. It is not the safest way to manage those uh, babies and toddlers. So we need to address our nursery space at this campus if, uh, in particular, our women's ministries are going to continue to uh, have impact and to grow. Secondly, uh, this space here, our our primary worship space, this is the largest um, program, if you will, that FBCG does on a regular basis. We we have 52 Sundays a year when we have two services in this room, um, and lots of other things happen in this room. It's our largest venue, and this room was never built to be a permanent worship center. That was not the intent we built this. This was built as a multi-purpose room slash gymnasium. Can you tell? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if you look down, there's a wood floor. If you look up, there's backboards. Um, so this room was not built. Even for, this is goofy. Yeah, this, this room was not built for what we're using it for now. And if we're not going to build the 2,000-seat worship center out there, which we're not, because that would cost upwards of 15 to $20 million to do just a dedicated room we can only use once a week, uh, we are thinking of doing something in here to make it a more appropriate place of worship, permanent place of worship that would still have multi-purpose capacity, but it would not be a gymnasium. Uh, and the third thing we're thinking about is Shepherd's Heart. Our Shepherd's Heart ministry, uh, it, it, we were talking about that a lot. It's really exploding. Many of you are involved in that ministry. Uh, we addressed it when we rehab, rehabbed the East Campus, gave it its own space. It's a nice kind of storefront down there, adding dignity and Uh, to that whole ministry, and it's more than doubled in the past two years, uh, both in terms of numbers of people serving, numbers of people we do serve, and uh, just so you know um, what our staff there, led by Aaron Wise and, of course, Bruce McAvoy, overall our Serve the World initiatives, uh, what they say often is it's not about the food. Uh, We have what we believe is the largest gospel-driven, compassionate ministry in Kane County, which is 
Uh, now, I don't know that for sure, but we believe it, it might be. That is, <laughs> we, just we don't ourselves. just give out food. We don't just give away clothes. Uh, we minister to people in, in, in the truth of the gospel, in the spirit of the gospel. There are sitting areas. We do counseling on Wednesday nights for financial counsel. We're getting to know people and their stories. We don't just hand out bags of food. Uh, and that ministry is growing in that way, which is very, very exciting to us. But it's trying to grow even more. Uh, North, we're now par a formal partner with Northern Illinois Food Bank. We're the largest distribution point in all of King County for Northern Illinois Food Bank. They would give us uh, freezers for frozen items if we had space to put them. Uh, we don't have that enough space right now. We need more storage space. Uh, we need um, more counseling space as they do financial counsel and personal counsel with, with clients that come in to use the the Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry. So all that to say is we are de really wrestling with what to do with Shepherd's Heart. How do we allow it to become what we think God might want it to become? And if it takes over more space at East Campus, what do we do with those offices that are down there now? If it comes out here to West, where are we going to put it? Um, so we are wrestling with three simultaneous issues right here at this campus, not to make it a bigger box necessarily, to make it a better box, uh, because it is the driving engine of all of our boxes, of all of our campuses, if we take out a third campus, if that makes sense. So we're pursuing, as leadership, two things simultaneously. The third campus possibility, feasibility, financials, legal, what does that mean uh, as a third campus for FVCG? And then this campus, what do we need to finish off here, if anything, and what does that look like? Do, they two, do, do the two of those arms go together in one project, or are they separate projects? They all need approval eventually by our voting membership, so we're studying that right now. We just want to be completely transparent. We're look, working on, on, on two directions simultaneously because they're related, although we may not end up presenting them at the same time to you because it depends how much work we can get done and how much clarity we have on both issues. That, that makes sense so far? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm the Shepherd's Heart thing. I see, I see Cheryl here. I, I don't, I'm, I'm sure Aaron, I don't, can, is Aaron here? Cheryl could speak to this. No, anyway, uh, I, I think if I have this right, if I'm wrong, just shake your head at me and tell me that's not right, Jeff. But I think since we built it, Shepherd's Heart was a closet uh, in the upstairs East Campus. Some of you know this. It wasn't even called Shepherd's Heart. It was a food pantry closet where we'd go and get a bag of groceries for people that came by in need. That was all it was. We built what's at the East Campus now, and it went from serving about 150, I think, families of people a month to uh, close to 800. So we're talking it's more than quadrupled since we built that thing. None of us saw that coming. That's just the food part. Brian mentioned all the other things that are going on, the financial counseling and the other kinds of counseling and the caring for people and resourcing them in the community. It's, it, it is really, that's just one thing that none of us saw coming. But because, because we're growing here and over there, the, God's doing these things. And I think part of the growing to serve has to include both. Is because if we don't pay attention to that, the inertia, the energy, the growth engine, we, we, it has to keep going, has to keep growing so that God will show us the next thing. Churches wouldn't be knocking on the door saying, would you take us over? We think we'd like to, for, you to, for this to be a campus if, if there's not exciting, gospel-centered, good things happening here. They don't make that call. And so I think that the, that's why I see them, even though they are probably, we talk about them in two different things, I see them as uh, growing to serve here, the future, and the third campus as part of the same vision. It's mm -hmm. part of the same direction that God's leading us. Anyway. Yeah, so um, the... the, the, the uh, Finish, I mean, the, the, one of the points in time we are keeping in mind as leadership is uh, August 21st because that is the scheduled date of our next annual meeting. At our annual meeting, we uh, will need to approve a budget for the next year, uh, which we always do. We're required to do that uh, at, by the voting membership. We are going to approve uh, or vote on the past pastoral transition, and we hope we'll also be presenting to you at least the option of, of uh, the third campus taking on Faith Baptist at Mill Creek. Some of you have ac actually raised the question, which we won't get, won't get into today, but raised the question at our last meeting. Okay, if we take that on, that's technically, that's, that's in Batavia. It wouldn't make much sense to call it First Baptist Church of Geneva at Batavia. So what about the name? So that issue has come up. We'll need time to study that and, and get your input on all that as well. But the timeline looks at August 21st. How much can we get done to present to you in a reasonable fashion so you can make a wise decision with us by August 21st. And if we don't have it all done by then, we won't present it. We'll present just budget and pastoral transition. But if we do, we'll be feeding you more information as we go throughout the summer, having more of these meetings 
because every week we're learning something else as we meet with their leadership and we meet with our leadership moving down the line. So that's as much as we wanted to just present to you the rest of the time together, and it's right about where we wanted it to be, 1229. We want you to be able to ask questions and have Ken, Jeff, myself, others from our leadership just respond as you have questions. So, Russ, do you mind handing that one to me? We have a couple mics here, so every question is okay. We, we learn from every question you ask. Uh, we try to anticipate them, but we don't always anticipate all the questions, so start asking questions um, based on what we've said so far. Someone back here? Yes. Thanks for getting us going, Darren. <laughs> Have you addressed yet uh, to us um, the motivation from that other church as why they asked for a merger and how does their motivation affect our feasibility studies? Great. Um, want to take it? No, go ahead. Great. How is it? Great question. <laughs> it feels like. Are there any bad questions? No, there, there aren't. Um, that particular question is a really good one. And so their primary motivation is that uh, Grant and their, the head of their board, and now their whole board and members of their church, see sort of the end in sight for the life cycle of their church. It's an older congregation in terms of their, their age. They don't have the resources and the inertia to keep going, and they kind of see that this is, this is coming to an end. We have to make a decision. I've talked to another pastor who, who has called us, and they were basically saying, like, look, it comes down to this. We're either going to, we're not going to continue. We're either going to sell this property and divide up the proceeds to charity, or we're going to try to see some gospel ministry continue here. So that's the heart of their motivation is coming to us. Now, we are in the feasibility stage of, of, of understanding and, and talking through what that actually means. The term merger is a little bit misleading because uh, Jim Tomberlin in his book, Better Together, refers to all church you know, connections that this, of this sort as mergers, but they're not all the same kind of merger. We are what would be described as a rebirth, death and resurrection, as it were, not a... Uh, a full partnership, but a, okay, that, that entity ceases to exist. There'll be a period of time where it would be shut down, where we would make some improvements to that property, develop our launch team and plan, and then it'd be re reborn as something new. So if that, is that, I don't know if you were here, we talked about that last time, but that's, it's, it's a good question. It's not really a, a true merger in the corporate sense. I for example, um, Ray's got his hand up right there. for example, one of the issues uh, to be resolved as we work through this is what happens to their leadership and their staff. Uh, their leadership would not join our leadership. Their leadership would cease to, their board would dissolve. We wouldn't be taking on any of their staff other than taking care of their pastor financially for a period of time. Um, and what would happen to their membership? Now, we would accept their members as becoming members of our church. Uh, that's one thing we've offered them. Uh, but we, there's not a blending of leadership. They would be joining FBCG taking on our DNA. They could join any campus they want, either campus, any service. They could get involved in serving. But their, that church will, will cease to, their, its history will end and becomes part of our history. Right here. I, I was going to build on that. What's the financial implication? Um, they, are they carrying significant debt? What's the operating cost that we'd be picking up? Well, the two, those are two different parts of the question, and probably, Doug, you could speak to this as well. We're in the process of examining all the financials. Operating costs, we would determine that because it'd be our plan and, and, and church DNA and, and operations there. The debt right now, I, think, I don't know the exact number, but it's in the neighborhood of, of a half a million dollars that they're carrying of debt. So not inconsequential, but not something that would be a deal breaker. It's mostly associated with the mortgage on the building in which yep. we would presumably refinance as part of the... And so, you know, it's sitting on all that, that, that facility you saw. Put, put it back up there again, what the building looks like. A lot of you have seen it. You'll know it. You can drive by it. Um, it's sitting on eight acres of property. Uh, so there's, there's plenty of nice space there to expand that building or for whatever you need. But that's what the building looks like. The building itself would not be adequate for us to start a, a new campus there today. It has inadequate worship space, inadequate children's space, which is why one of the reasons we said no at the beginning, we just couldn't see it working for us because they kind of ran out of money when they were trying to build it, and so they stopped. Uh, we would need to do, uh, in addition to the half million dollars to take to absorb their debt, we also need to study what it's going to take to make that a functional, uh, highly functional church 
an environment for a ministry to grow. So we have to look at that and see what, it, what that would cost. Don. No. Is, no. is there acquisition cost in addition to debt is the question. I think the short answer to that is no, we're not purchasing the land. It would be, you know, we would acquire it without, without a purchase price. So you get that right, Doug? Yeah. There, I mean, obviously there may be some of the normal legal fees, transactional fees, et cetera. Uh, we don't see anything extraordinary associated with that. It's largely the transaction of taking on the mortgage or managing the debt that they currently are responsible for. Thank you. There's a couple back there in the lead, sorry. One of the beauties of the East-West situation now is having both of you having a pastoral presence in the building. And I wondered how you would account for that in a new site. Uh, that would be critical in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we would have to have that. So we would, there would be a campus pastor there. So, um, Which would not be one of us. Right. Let me back up from that and say that uh, when people hear the term multi-site, that's an umbrella term that conjures up different images and different minds. Some of you might be like, I don't even know what that means. Others of you, you're thinking perhaps of, of the Harvest or Willow model where it's a video venue and there's a worship team, but it's not a... We're not talking about that. We're talking about predominantly live preaching with a pastoral presence on that campus, which would not be either of us. However... I could envision it this way. The campus pastor would preach live there twice a month. One of us might preach there live one other time a month, and they might have a video of one of us once a month. So it would be a hybrid model, predominantly live preaching, but not exclusively so, to keep us sort of part of the same family DNA. We'd all three campuses be hearing the same series and the same sermons, the same texts, so we'd be part of the same pastoral presence that way as well. But that's, does that answer your question? Yeah. There's someone in the back there, I think. Yes. Can you please speak to the, uh, briefly, uh, to the history of that church, to its current organizational structure, its denominational uh, implications, and also you alluded earlier to um, the congregation. Uh, it sounded to me like being old, getting older, like all of us. Uh, what is the current makeup uh, in terms of the um, existing uh, population at that church? Well, if you were at the East Campus today, you probably realize I can't speak to anything briefly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that church is an older demographic in terms of their age, significantly so. Not exclusively, but it's a, it's a small and shrinking congregation with, with, uh, with people that are well past empty nest into retirement years and beyond. Um, and th so that's the de makeup of that. The history is older than our church, 180 years old. Is that right, mm -hmm. Brian? 180 years old. Um, as, as Brian said, most of their history has been the First Baptist Church of Batavia. Downtown Batavia yeah. that now belongs to the city. That building is still there, but it belongs to the city. Their denominational heritage is American Baptist. And um, so they actually had another um, church suitor, if you will, <laughs> interested in, 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 in acquiring them as a campus. That church is out of Naperville, and they were debating for a while whether they were going to uh, pursue with us or the other church. One of the strengths and comforts they felt was that they, we felt more familiar, we're closer in geographically, we're more familiar and uh, aligned doctrinally and theologically, and with the Baptist heritage, and I think, I think my, my sense is, once some of them come and experience our East Campus worship and other places, they'll feel very comfortable here as well for a time. So, but that's, I th I think there were several aspects to your question, did I miss one? A little bit about the history. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah. We we did hear at one of our meetings we had some of their um, a couple of their board members just share their story. Yeah. One of them had been a member there for close to 50 years, as I recall. Grew up as a little girl in that church and just telling stories of what she remembered. Uh, as I recall, I want to be fair here. Uh, the the most vibrant time in that church's life was probably back in the 50s, and has been shrinking ever since. Um, and they made a few decisions. Um, it's, it was really extraordinary to hear, and it was kind of sad to hear. Um, but they made a series of decisions in the 60s and 70s regarding their building uh, that were diametrically opposite to what FBCG's history did back with our building, the one that was on the corner of Anderson and Hamilton in Geneva. When 
They chose to move from there in 1961 or two to the South Street location. The First Baptist of Batavia had the same opportunity and decided to stay downtown. And they stayed there long enough that their building got so old that when they went to address it at all, it was going to cost a million dollars just to bring it up to code, and they didn't have the money. So their building almost literally suffocated the church because they didn't make certain decisions that our predecessors, our ancestors made years ago in, in, in casting vision for our, this church going forward. But I would say this so that she told us of vibrancy back when her childhood and it's been struggling for the last 15, 20 years. And now it's down to maybe 40 or 50 people regularly on a Sunday morning. And um, they, their, their entire church would fit in half of that section right over there. So um, some of them have visited our church already, have come to East Campus Worship, because that was their tradition, was traditional worship. They don't have that now. They have a contemporary model and what they've, what they've been doing the last few years. So we've invited them to come check it out. They're invited to come anytime. Yeah. The main thing we would need to do with, with that group is be very pastoral and understanding of the pain they're going through. Mm -hmm. This is a deep grief reaction for a lot of them who have been there for a long time. Imagine watching your church kind of die right around you and you're part of it. I don't think we can kind of wrap our minds around how sad that is for some of them. And we would need to really go out of our way to welcome, to celebrate the best of their history, to acknowledge it really did happen. Some of them came to know the Lord there. Some of them were baptized there. We're going to have to celebrate that history. At the same time, welcome them and allow them to go through a grieving process as they enter our mm -hmm. midst. So we would, we would try to do a good job of that whenever that time is. But that's a little bit of their story. Right. I'm glad yeah. Brian said that. I think we, we would want to set even some celebration moments in our services to celebrate and tell a bit of their story, to welcome them and publicly. And to, um, because even though it's a smaller congregation, it's not insignificant. And they're joint, they're, they're, there is, uh, we've talked, as Brian mentioned, at length over dinner one night after Saturday night service that they came to visit where they told that story. And I, I want to echo what Brian said. It was touching, sad but uh, really realize that this, this, this story needs to be told and become part of our story, that together, actually, we'd become something that didn't exist before. Uh, it'd be good for us as well. So, can you Yeah, two, two points on that. One, it's very important to emphasize what Brian just said, and that's the sensitivity around this. These, these people are your neighbors. And now that you know about this, you know, obviously we want to ask you to, to be sensitive to that. And if the conversation comes up, just know that this is, this is a very difficult process for them. I think part of what uh, the reason that they chose us is because they, they do feel we're, we're aware of that, sensitive to that, and, and will handle that appropriately. You should know, though, that today, this weekend, they are also letting their membership know that they have entered into this diligence phase uh, with us. So that is something that they have made their membership aware of, okay? So it's fine to talk about it now by name. I change gears and ask about Shepherd's Heart. It sounds like an ex, you know, a great ministry, um, both for serving as well as reaching people for Christ. Is it a possibility of expanding that? For example, taking the old Dominic space, that it becomes another venue in the community where we expand the ministry, but it doesn't have to be on the campus of one of the church buildings. You know, that, that's a very interesting question. We have looked at that. Should Shepherd's Heart be connected to a church campus or should it be its own standalone building? For example, the, the Avenue Chevrolet in Batavia, we talked about that, the old, the old Aldi down there in Batavia. Even when we first, in the early stages, should Mill Creek be a Shepherd's Heart? Could it be that? One of the things we've been learning through, and Cheryl and Aaron and Bruce have been telling us this, is that one of the things we saw happen is when we connected Shepherd's Heart in proximity and visibility and accessibility to our nerve center, if you will, of our, of our Monday through, through uh, Friday ministry offices of the East Campus, people in, in our own church got excited, got stirred up uh, to serve. I, we think it, it would be a strategic, we're considering that it might be a strategic error to put that somewhere else than one of our campuses. And right now, we think the places that have the most exposure, accessibility, notoriety, and, uh, and, avail and availability would be east or west. So our thinking right now probably is that it would go east or west. Whether it's a standalone building, we don't know yet. But that's still, I mean, that's still open. Um, Cheryl, do you want to add anything to that? I know we, we were in another conversation. Okay. That we think p part of what we didn't see coming is the fact that it's connected to our church life throughout the week. It's not somewhere else forgotten and you have to drive over there and only the people who, who need help or really care about those people go there. It's not, that's not what it is. It's 
part of us every day. And that's been, didn't see that coming, but really important. Over there, Russ. I was waiting to change the subject. Thanks for doing it. I was going to ask about the same thing. Have, along those lines, have we thought, you know, as a community church, as we're looking to, you know, this is, would be the third campus or something long term, about turning Shepherd's Heart into more of a um, connection into our church? Or are those 800 plus people, are we seeing those people connected to our church? Or are they going to other churches? Are we looking to expand? And I mean, Mill Creek is a lot of like the same as we have here now. Are we looking to expand into, you know, pulling in different demographic, maybe different language sets um, mm -hmm. from our community and kind of, exp you know, maybe not like a, a store that they would go to, but it, a church that yeah. we would kind of be connected with? Yeah, that's a great question. We, <clears throat> uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was approached by a businessman um, about an opportunity to partner with him, um, if our church wanted to partner with him in a venture down on Aurora. A building was becoming available, and he wanted to use half of it for a business, and he wanted if we could use the other half. And one of the things we kind of bare, bare, talked about, this is way before Neighborhood Church Vision became like it is now, but we're, well, what, what would that look like? Could we put something down there? Uh, anyway, but the, the, the long and short of it is, one of the exciting things about a neighborhood church model is that very thing, it becomes possible. Um, because uh, the, the, the neighborhood church uh, vision would spread as, as locations become available. One of the, uh, as Jim Tomberlin has taught us, the most, the, two, the most difficult question is location. Having, getting a place, getting a facility, whether it's a church or a building or something, and then considering is that in a neighborhood that can be reached? Is that in a neighborhood that can be whatever the neighborhood is? Um, and so it's possible so we, we could have much more success, for example, in reaching, a, let's, say, let's say, a language group or, a, or an ethnic group, for example, by planning a church, a, a campus, where the, close to where they live rather than inviting them to come all the way to here. You know? So that becomes possible. We don't know. We don't have an intentional plan right now because it depends if something comes available. Yeah. But if you think about the reach of Kane County, uh, a family of neighborhood churches <laughs> could someday include a church in, you know, West Chicago, in North Aurora, in South Batavia, and somewhere where, where the, the neighborhoods look a little different than we do. Uh, we partner in different ways. We still have our DNA, but it's, it, that becomes possible in the neighborhood church model. So, in other words, right now, there's not an intentional plan to do that, but there's an openness if something becomes available at the right time to become just, one Just of along those lines, I've had two emails and a phone call from three different churches since this first thing started happening. Well, not just me, we have that have asked similar questions. Right now, they seem a little bit outside of our scope and further away, than, than, but I, I absolutely, well, Brian says it in terms of it could happen, I think it will. I can't tell you when or how, but I think if, if, if God's in this, and, and this third campus is a vital, vibrant, worshiping, uh, neighbor-loving, reaching church engine like we are, like this church, like this campus is, I think it's going to happen. We'll, we would wanna be reproducing and representing certain ministries. So for example, if you think about what makes us us, we're, by, we're not, in any, by any stretch, the only good church around. There's lots of good churches. But kind of what makes us us is, in addition to the preaching of the word and, and ministering to families, is our serve the world emphasis and now our shepherd's heart emphasis. Those things need to be represented. Every place that, that part of the member family DNA, that's part in our, our special needs ministry, our masterpiece ministry, and those things are part of our DNA. We would want to do those things in other, cam other campuses. Some of those things we would have to reproduce. We can't, Others we just would represent there. So for example, Shepherd's Heart, even though it might have a hub, a central place where the storage and the ministry is happening, we might have like a smaller food pantry or a booth or a, a ministry kiosk center that represented every one of our campuses for that, for that ministry, talking about it, making it known. Um, I, I think I, that's what I mean by reproducing who we are as a church, our, our vital gospel-centered DNA. I think I said more than I intended to say there. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so... Excuse my voice. I love the idea that God has planted about this neighborhood church, um, but piggybacking this, um, Pastor Jeff, you made a comment that we're reaching within a 15 minute or 15 mile radius. You know, 15 minute driving. 15 distance. minute drive. 80% of our worshiping body. So my question is that does that Mill Creek church have too much overlap with that 15 minute yeah. reach? Um, I, I appreciate that it's available now and that model is on our ministry heart, but is that the perfect solution? 
if we maybe are already reaching those people in the campuses that we have? Well, I'm not convinced we're reaching all those people in the campuses that we have. We're reaching some of them. So that, uh, it's a very good question. One I wrestled with. My first initial reaction was, it's too close. I've actually come to see its proximity as a strength, not as a barrier. So even, it's, a, it's about a 10-minute drive now. Put, the image so up, the, put, put that yeah. map image up there so Jeff can refer to it. Uh, so if you imagine, um, imagine if you will, Do you have it? Well, imagine there a map. Oh, yeah, okay, good. So it's, it's, uh, it's about a 10-minute drive, give or take. You know, traffic could be less, a little bit more if, uh, if, you know, about that. If you drew circles around the, the two dots we have now of our campuses, a 15-minute driving, <laughs> there's a lot of overlap between east and west. There would be some overlap uh, between that one and, and our west campus. But you've got to imagine how far out that circle goes to where we're not reaching. Uh, to people that aren't currently coming to that place. So Mill Creek is kind of a world unto itself. We're reaching Mill Creek families. But imagine if we took a core of those Mill Creek families that were committed to the gospel and reaching their neighbors, and that became a growth engine then, and there's another circle drawn there. And then, who, there, I, and I'm not going to place dots on the map, but you can imagine it with me, can't you? Other dots so, so far out. So we're not thinking 30 minutes out right now or an hour out. We're thinking inside of that sphere of influence. Because this first one, I don't know why I'm still standing, this first one, I think, really needs to go well. If this is what God's doing, we, we need to prayerfully and thoughtfully do this one really well so that we have sort of a template and a pattern then to do the next one when God brings that our way, when, whenever that happens. But that's a, that's a question we have been wrestling our way through. Any, you want to add to that one? No, other than, not really other than to say that, that I did, I made that, made that drive a couple of times, and it's, it's, it's a good 10-minute drive from here to get to that campus. And if you took a 10-minute drive from there going, going south... You get to a whole region where we have few people coming from. Or west. But even, uh, or south or west, yeah. But if you look at just where the church is, there are a thousand homes within like a mile and a half of that campus. The opportunity is a neighborhood, a genuine neighborhood church. And it's the only church. Well, there's two, actually, that, that would be reaching that neighborhood. So that's what I, my initial reaction was a little too close. But then when I really made the drive and they really looked at where it is, and that this isn't the last one we would try, it's the first one, and it has a, I think it has an enormous potential for, for real success if we, put, if we shut it down, reshape it, put our DNA in there with a campus pastor, like Jeff said, his vision, 100 families who are already living near there or in there, who, are, who see this as their vision, who don't just want to be part of a small church, but who want to reach their neighbors, now you have a dynamic extension of our DNA. Then the then one after that might be 10 minutes south of there, or west or east or whatever, whatever becomes available. So um, we've moved from that exact question to, no, I actually think this is actually the right first one for us because of proximity and because of the neighborhood it, it would serve. Yep. So my question is, you talk about a similar DNA moving some sort of leadership from here over to this campus. How do you extrapolate that out for doing that again and again? How do you continue to grow that leadership up within the church? I mean, it seems like you'd have to accelerate whatever plan you have in order to keep accommodating that right. vision. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's precisely why Brian's sticking around and what he's going to do next. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, that, we have started to really look at, at that, and it gets us into... Uh, um, We've, leadership development is part of what we're trying to do now, but we think we're kind of at the beginning edge of that. By leadership development, we mean our existing ministry staff, which is in several rings. We have our senior staff, we have our ministry staff, and we have all of our staff. And you may not know, those rings are like we have about 10 or 12 senior leaders who lead departments. We have about 30 ministry staff, and our total staff is about 55 if you include facilities people and administrative staff and th those sorts of things. So we're, we're, we're building a culture of leadership development among our staff. We also have our summer internship program, which we call Leadership Institute. One of my roles in the coming few years will be to take what we're doing in leadership development and take it to the next level. Meaning, for example, building not just a summer internship program for college students that we have now. We have 13 kids coming in at the end of this month, by the way, to work all summer in our ministries. But to take that to what we're calling right now uh, a residency program that would be like a year to two years where we're actually training campus pastors, potential campus pastors, identifying them in our congregation or outside our congregation to work with us for a year or two, start learning preaching, start learning leadership, so that we 
fi- are constantly finding the next team of people two years from now to go out. So that needs to be part of our DNA. If we're going to do this, we need to be developing the next generation of leadership prior to finding a, a, a place. So, Which a healthy church should be doing anyway. Right. And we kind of are un- organically... I see this as like it's putting a microscope and like, okay, now you're going to have to get intentional about what's sort of all just been happening in between the lines around here. Now you're going to have to name it and and lay it out and get clear about it and pray for it and pursue it. Because you're exactly right, Todd. We're not going to, it it, it will accelerate the need uh, or put a a focus on the need to raise up leaders. And and by the way, I don't want you to hear us saying we're going to be in some big hurry to like 10 campuses in five years or something. That's not the vision. I think God has brought this one to us, and if he's in it, we'll know, and we'll, we'll, we'll follow him um, on that. And then the next one, when it comes, and there may be opportunities that come that we think, but after this, if this happens, there may be a fourth opportunity that comes that we say no to. I envision that. We already have. We had a church from the uh, uh, West Chicago Wheaton uh, border area approach us, and in our denomination, basically, we're like, that's just too far away for our first, it just doesn't seem like the right thing. So I, I don't want you to hear that, like, all of a sudden, we'll be on some fast track to that. Dan. Well, it is Dan, isn't it? Yes, it is Dan. I, I recognize your forehead <laughs> from back here. <laughs> well, this is very exciting, so thank you for the explanation. You know, a while back, we had a sister church that we launched. We were at a different place in time. Um, what have we learned from that? Um, how is it the same? How is it different? Um, because that was really a neighborhood approach in a way. Yes, that, that very question came up last meeting. I'll let Brian answer it because he answered it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you said. <clears throat> yeah, no, we, we did. And that's been about a decade, 10, 11 years ago. We launched a church that's now called Valley Brook Community Church. Um, that was a completely different thing. <clears throat> and if you remember, the, the model we followed at that time, um, and it was primarily under uh, Kevin Engel's vision and leadership, but was to... Um, we, we brought in a, a, a pastor that we interviewed to be a plant pastor. He was from outside FECG. He did not have our tradition, our DNA, but our, he, he came from the outside. He was here for um, a matter of uh, months, six, eight months, six, six, know, months. Six, six to seven months. And he recruited anybody who would go with him. We told him you can take as many as you want. He took about 100 people with him. Uh, to go start a church. And their model was for them to become independent as fast as possible. That was the model. And they did become independent as fast as possible to the point where um, there was very little contact between churches by their desire. Um, And there's lots of reasons for that. This model is completely different because this would be someone, uh, our team going out to plant would would be people who are already here right now who have grown up under our leadership and in our DNA, who would go plant the same DNA there with, our, with people from this church. We would stay centrally governed uh, by a central staff and central leadership, uh, and there would be all the interconnections would stay. So it would stay under the umbrella of FECG. Um, would not be, it wouldn't be an independent thing. So it's a totally different animal. And, and the statistics on that, by the way, that Jim Tomlin has shared with us, and I, I, Jeff can rattle these off, uh, but uh, the failure rate of a true church plant 60%. is somewhere around 60%, the failure rate. Uh, we've just been, one of the, uh, we were contacted recently by a church plant in our region that, that's, that wants to merge, but they don't even have a building. Just like Valleybrook doesn't have a building yet after 10 years. They still are in schools, uh, so they haven't failed, but they're, they're not exactly thriving the way we would want this our, this new campus to thrive. Um, failure rate's high, but the success rate of, of multi-site, of, a, of the next campus for a multi-site is somewhere around 70 or 80%. Um, so it's, it's vastly different model with vastly different success rates. And so that's why we're interested in this particular model at this time. Yep. Coming behind you, Kelly. Mr. Microphone Come, yeah. approaches. Um, is this particular model uh, one where there becomes a limit to how many uh, plants you can have, especially you mentioned that um, we're going to be following um, the same uh, preaching subjects. Um, is there a point at which you, there's going to be so many pastors that 
you know, we'd be playing kind of the, the position of Pope <laughs> and everybody else kind of uh, under our... You. Do you know what I mean, though? It's like, yeah. who's going to be... At what point do you have too many churches, too many pastors for us all to be of the same mind, of the same sermon series? How, how is that? You know, I, that, I, I think achieved. about that a lot. I don't know okay. what the answer is. I know there are churches that are like, like uh, Life, uh, wait, no, Life Church TV, Life TV, whatever, whatever they get, Rochelle's, Craig Rochelle's church, 100,000 people and well, 25, 25 sites. 25 sites yeah. So I'm not, I don't think that's us at all. But I don't know what the number is for us. And there, I know some multi-site churches that are now starting to think that the time has come to start cutting these loose and, and blessing them to be totally independent. And that, but it's taken a decade. So I think, we, I think we want to go where God leads on that. I don't know what the number is, and I'm not... Yeah, there's all kinds of models out there. This is kind of new for us. I, I've been doing a little, little research looking around, and, and you'd be surprised. I know something like 60% of churches our size and up are doing this now. All across, it's the, it's the movement across North America because it's cheaper than building larger and larger barns. It's more effective in reaching new neighborhoods. It's just happening. I came across a church in Michigan. I was looking for leadership development stuff. I came across a church in Michigan I'd never heard of before. It has 12 sites. I thought, how can I not know about a church that has 12 sites? I'd never heard about it before. I thought you knew everything. <laughs> but they, and some of them have campus pastors, each one. Some of them don't. Some of them have the main guy preaching in all the video screens. Craig Rochelle's church. It's him on the video at all 25 sites every weekend, so they have no problem with preaching series. But it's a video model. We don't want to do a primary video model. So at some point, it becomes pretty complex. We don't know where that is. We'll have to go step by step and see what's right for us. But the key ingredient for us, if God leads us there, we're going to follow and we're going to listen. Look, look here's the, 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 I keep thinking about this. If we weren't two sites with multiple venues, I probably would have had to leave to, to grow into the leadership gifts God was blessing me with. Uh, I, hope, I hope that it doesn't happen in August. Right? <laughs> but my, my point is, as, the, as our church grew and opportunities grew and the needs grew and my gifts grew, there were, there's a place for that. I'm so grateful that happened here. I see this as another opportunity to do that. So I, I, there may be an end game out there where that's too many, we've got to bless them and cut them loose. I don't know, but we're nowhere near that. I get excited about what if there were five or six pastors and we met together weekly to pray over the text that we're all going to preach independently. Uh, that would be fun. That would be exciting, you know. Um, part of a movement. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of fun between here and whenever that day comes. Hey, we're over, uh, what time? I want to make Just sure we have time one, to pray. Yeah, one more question. Um, it, in moving to multi-site, thanks, it, it, it does seem to be a concern about um, getting new pastors and keeping um, whole congregations on the same teaching and everything. Is there any discussion about um, expanding or strengthening the adult learning communities? at all of the campuses, uh, growing leaderships for that, just sort of um, using that as a way to reach people in addition to the big Sunday morning? Um, no. The short answer is no, to be really honest with you. I think we, I, I, I've been under, over that area and, for about eight years now, and where we see the energy and the inertia and the excitement and the growth is in, is in C groups and book clubs, neighborhood groups. I'm not saying those don't matter. I'm not saying we don't care about them, but we don't right now see those as the primary strategic thing that we want to reproduce at a new campus. I'm not opposed to them, love, but young families, that's, that's just not, I mean, those aren't the ones that, those aren't the groups, the things that are growing and causing growth here. Um, and so that's just, you know, kind of a brutally honest short answer to that. I hope you don't hear me say I don't care about adult learning communities. We do. We like them. We want them to grow. But what is growing, what does have energy and inertia uh, is, is our other things, particularly our, seat, our book club. Yeah, I think the way to say it would be... <laughs> Sorry, say it the way I should say it. <laughs> yeah. I think the way, to say, the way to say it would be what he's saying is that what we conceive of as adult learning communities here in the East Campus is, is the, that's the remnant of the old model of Sunday school for adults. The model that's take the new adult learning community is happening in homes and book clubs. That's just a new adult learning community. Adult learning communities will happen in neighborhoods and homes following the neighborhood model but would be highly committed to making sure that happens and that will take leadership. It will take people trained to lead book clubs and all that. It'll just happen in a different way. So, we, so likely when we open this first, the first third campus, as it were, we, we would be thinking primarily about preaching, worship, and children's ministry happening on that campus to start with, not adult classes. Everybody would be in worship and everybody would be with children. The adult learning communities would happen during the week in people's homes. That's the way I would see it. What's that? 
The people aren't. The, I mean, yeah, well, it would be led by a campus pastor teaching people to lead in their homes. Imagine yeah. this with me. We're preaching through uh, the letters of Paul in the, in the years from now, and there's multiple campuses. And every one of those campuses is made up of people that are in book clubs and they're like reading through the, and so they're reading the letters of Paul in their homes during the week, hearing the sermons preached every week, and there's five or six campuses and we're all doing that together. And you're walking around, you see somebody at, at Jewel and they got out their, their letters of Paul and you go, you're reading that too? Which campus do you go to? I didn't even know that. Then you, you evangelize somebody right there on the grocery line, line who doesn't even know Jesus. You share Christ with them, give them the letter of Paul. They come to Christ. You can't even believe it. The checkout lady gets excited and she comes to Christ. And the bag boy, he comes to Christ. They're all going to your campus right there. And the next thing you know, the, 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 the guy who runs Jewel, he f wants to know what this ruckus is at the counter. And he comes over and he's like, what are you people doing? I got to get involved in this. And, he's, and he gives all his food he gets saved, heart. And he gives and all his food to Shepherd's heart. And he can go he on like Jewel. this for a long, long time. <laughs> no, but I, 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 I'm having fun with it. But the point as I'm thinking is like the alignment that we're Our we're meetings all go like this. We can't ever get anything done because they just go like this. <laughs> But I do see like a sense of alignment. We're moving in the same direction. We're learning the same things about, from the Word of God. We're studying it and discussing it together in homes throughout the week uh, in multiple places. I, I, we're over time. Yeah. So, so first off, awesome questions. We're going to do this again. We need to do this again. A couple of key points here. One, a family of, of neighborhood churches. We want, we want to get your heads wrapped around that. We want, we want you to, to really uh, understand and hopefully embrace that vision. The second part of that is what's next in moving along that vision. Uh, is it going to be Faith Baptist? We're going to go through that process now. And in going through that process, we're going to discover a number of details. We're going to put some more uh, plans together. We're going to have a much better understanding of what that would look like, and we want you to know that. So in the coming weeks and months, we're going to provide some written material. There's going to be some information on our website, and we will have another one of these meetings. We said we're going to have four. We think we're probably going to have five. Uh, because at some point, if we move along this process and it moves along as uh, we anticipate, then we would want to put before you uh, a motion to consider at the August 21st meeting. And in order for us to do that, we want to make sure we give you plenty of time to consider that motion. So we'll probably have another one of these meetings in order for the membership uh, to have that opportunity if we progress through that series of, of decisions. And that's an if. Um, and so we want to be very careful. As I mentioned to you, the last time we were together that, you know, the great thing about being on executive council is our job is to help them do the things that they need to do and also to help them not move at a pace that, that, that they should move at. And uh, over the last couple of days, we've had some great meetings together to really map out all the different elements. There's a lot of things to do. So we want to be mindful of God's timing in this, God's timing in this. And that's really where our focus is. And um, uh, with that, we need to to engage you. We need you to be engaged, uh, to participate, to be a part of this, because it really is something that, um, regardless of whether or not you're a member or you're a congregational member, this is something we want you to be a part of. We want you to share this vision. Okay? Let me set you up. Yeah. Um, I, if you can hang in there, I'd like to do it, close this in prayer in a particular kind of way. First of all, let me just say, would members of the Executive Council that are here, would you stand up so people can see you? Not that you need to be seen, but I just want, I want to probably say thanks to these men and there's, are Amy or Stephanie here? Not, not today, they've probably got busy stuff going on. But I just want to say thanks to these guys for the time they're putting in and praying so you can see who else to ask questions of if you have those questions and who's uh, leading us on this effort. So thank you guys for, for doing that. Um, I, I've been, uh, I led our staff through a little uh, devotional exercise in the book of Esther. Uh, Bruce is always quoting Esther for such a time as this. He's always using that little line, you know, thrown in there. If you know the story of Queen Esther, grew, grows up in a family, uh, uh, in, uh, of is, she's a, is a Hebrew, is an Israelite family, but it's a captive nation. She's born into it. She didn't choose that lot in life. She didn't ask for it. She didn't decide on it. She, it just happens to her. But God and his sovereignty over her situation uses her to do something remarkable. And when, he, when, when that happens, there's a place in Esther where she, when Mordecai is coming to her and he says to her, you, how do you not know that for such a time as this you came to this position to be in, in the royal court? And she says, okay, I'm going to have to go to the king because there's a decree to wipe out the Israelites and I won't get into the whole story. You can read it. And you should. But she says, you fast and pray with all the Israelites and I'll do the same. And then I'll go to the king. And I remember the book of Nehemiah 
another historical book right in the same, near the same period of time in Israel's history. Nehemiah, when he hears about the condition of the wall and the people in, in, left in Jerusalem, he's broken over it, he weeps over it, and before he does anything, goes to the Artaxerxes and asks for permission and, and for uh, conscripts and all of this, he, he fasts and prays. And I, we've been saying to you at every church family meeting, please pray with us and pray for us for unity, for clarity, and for courage that God would not divide us, but unite us in this process, that he'd give us the clarity to know what he's doing, not what we think should be happening, and the courage to follow where he leads. So th I know many of you are praying, because you tell me, thank you, and keep praying. And I want to close our prayer a time. Well, I think there's going to come a time where we're going to say as a church family, let's fast and pray. Maybe at our next church family meeting, we'll, we're going to put that together and call you to it. But for now, I'd like to close not just with me praying, but for you gathering up together in three or four right where you sit. If you have to move your row, go ahead and do that. I know it's awkward, but, you know, I told you to. Um, cluster up with the three or four people and pray right now. Let's all pray together that God would keep us unified as a church family, that he'd clarify this vision, if this is what, in fact what he's, where he's leading us, and that he'd give us the courage to either hold back or to follow if that's what he's doing.